Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, episode 17 of the One Stump Short podcast. I'm joined today by a writer and broadcaster who's also a member of Middlesex County Cricket Club and the Western Storm. Please welcome to the show, Isabel Westbury. Hi, Izzy, how are you? Good afternoon. Very well, thank you. Nice to be on here. Yeah, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, it's been great, great to have you on. And uh, obviously, the, the place really I think we should start is the Women's World Cup, which is in progress as we speak. Sri Lanka and Australia are going head to head, as are the West Indies and India. It's been a, an interesting start, I think, to the tournament. The opening day loss for England against India. Uh, Australia thus far looking extremely strong, defending champions, of course. What have you made of the tournament thus far? I think it's um, it's most exciting I've seen um, since it's sort of the first edition back in 1973. It's a the most exciting because we're starting to see some really big hitting, clean hitting, um, women clearing the boundaries on on regular occasions, which always is, is sort of a, a crowd pleaser. But also because the, um, the strength and depth is, is is certainly growing in terms of the gap between the top three teams: your Australia's, New Zealand's, England's and uh, perhaps lesser-known entities such as Pakistan, formerly even India, South Africa. You know, we're seeing not just upsets, but, but tight matches on, on quite regular occasions. Yeah, you mentioned the, the, I call it the parity of the tournament here. A lot of people before beforehand would have probably favoured an England-Australia final, I think. You speak to most people, they they probably still would just about based on Australia being Australia and England having that sort of home field advantage, shall we call it. But... Uh, Go sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 one thing I said straight at the, at the beginning of the tournament, and I got a little bit worried at one point. I, I, New Zealand have been my favourites um, right from the beginning. Mm. Um, I, I feel as though they've got the perfectly balanced side. You've got your big hitters of say, Susie Bates, Rachel Priest, Sophie Devine at the top of the order. You've got your um, you know, Miss Consistent and Amy Satterthwaite um, in, in the batting, Katie Martin as well, and then... You've got your, your wonderful seamers, you've got Holly Huddleston, you've got Leah Tahuhu in a bit of pace, and then you've got your spinners, exciting 16-year-olds coming through the ranks. I think when they get their, their team firing, I mean, they're, they're almost a, a very similar to South Africa in the men's tournament. That they never actually win the damn thing. Um, but in terms of, of, of who I think are the real deal, I think New Zealand are up there. I got a little bit worried when they lost quite easily to England in the warm-up. Mm. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I think I, 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 I would, if I could bet, put money on them. It's interesting you say that's a, a team that Adam Collins brought up a few weeks ago. And when I spoke to Adam, sort of, a, I call it a tournament preview for lack of a better word. But again, he, he kind of made the similar point to yourself that some people had maybe undersold New Zealand because, well, as I said, England are the hosts. So they, there's been a lot of media focus on them uh, as hosts. And obviously Australia, again, defending champions. So they've really been the standard bearer for quite a long time now, or certainly over the last sort of call it yeah. 10 years. Whereas, I mean, at South Africa as well, uh, full of confidence. Obviously, yesterday's game between New Zealand and South Africa rained off, which... Yeah, that was a real shame. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to maybe to see how that affects things, because at the moment, New Zealand and South Africa both are on three points because they've had a win and, and a no result. But, of course, it's it's what it does in terms of, of what India do today, because if India beat the West Indies, which, looking at... Look as though they're going yeah, to be. you know, the West Indies have, have struggled to put put too many on the board they're, they're still going they've got five votes to go as we as we speak but their their th- big three haven't really clicked uh, and <laughs> and so it looks like India might might pick up their second win of the tournament so that sort of element it becomes interesting as well because you then start talking about net run rate and as you sort of said it, it's that parity and that option to to look beyond two or three big teams and say well we've realistically got five teams here who could make the knockout stage and equally, yeah. those five, maybe with a little bit of fair weather, a little bit of a back wind, so to speak, any of those five could go on and win it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's definitely more of a lottery than it was once before. And that can only be good for the game, good for women's sport and good for the highlights reel. Yeah, and that's that's one thing that's, that's maybe caught my eye a, a little bit about this this tournament. I mean, I'll, I'll hold my hands up. I don't know a, a, a huge in-depth amount about women's cricket. I, I, there's sort of the household names, your Sarah Taylors and uh, Perry and, and so forth. But this seems to be a tournament that's highlighted how much closer, uh, shall we say, that the, the top teams are. As, yeah. as we sort of said already, though, those sort of top eight teams aren't as far apart as they once were. And obviously the West Indies won the, the 2020, was it last year they won? Uh, and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it, it's a tournament that she's really almost a milestone and a point. It's highlighting how far the game has come, uh, yeah. you know, both domestically and internationally. It's sort of a, a microcosm of the whole thing. But also that 
you know, as a point that the women's game can really kick off from because the prize money involved this year is much higher than it has been in the past, which you know, is a great step forward. And, and I know Claire Connor recently was, was talking about, I think it was a Night Watchman podcast, which she said, you know, the, the conversations now, they aren't being driven by her when, when the MCC and groups like that meet, which, which she says is yeah. great. You know, they're being driven by other people. She doesn't got to bang her fists on the desk and try and shout. Other people are now taking that conversation on. And, and it seems like a really pivotal point for the women's game this World Cup. Yeah, I think it could be both on and off a pitch. Um, I think I wrote something also about um, women working behind the scenes in administrative roles. I think, you know, it's just about normalising, I think, women just both succeeding on the pitch, off the pitch, and being involved in sport. Yeah, and that's interesting. I've got a little girl, she's five now, and, and she seems to have that very sort of binary boys-girls thing still at the moment. Mm. And it's trying to, I mean, partially that's because the, the local club I play at just, just has men's teams at the moment and then there aren't many girls in the juniors. So maybe she's kind of picked that up a little bit from there. Mm. So it's one of those things where she's, I'm trying to say to her, like, you know, you can play football, you can play cricket, you can play rugby, you can you do what you want, literally. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah. if, if that's what you want to go and play and do, you know, that you can go and play and do that and, and if she gets to that point where she says well I want it to be a career well we're in that kind of we're starting to move into that world where it could legitimately be be a career because the money is now there whereas in the past people had to kind of juggle sporting interests and you know other interests to pay the bills uh, yeah absolutely uh, unless you mm. started playing tennis in the age of about five and suddenly find yourself a superstar with a as a persistent dad to go with it then um, then that was about it yeah <laughs> yeah and, and interestingly you say because obviously Tim Wigmore did a, a piece this week about and um, oh the name escapes me which is terrible because it really shouldn't um it was a British player she's just outside the top top 100 no, 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 it wasn't Hannah Conte. It was somebody who she's a young British girl she she missed out on qualification for Wimbledon last year um right in the I think it was the final of the qualification tournament and and Tim basically spoke to her and she travels to tournaments effectively on her own because obviously she's yeah. got to pay her way. She, if she takes a coach, she has to pay the coach and things like this. And, and just kind of the, the life that exists for semi-pro, borderline pro sportsmen. Uh, and yeah, I was going to say, it's not, I think with tennis, especially at that mm. stage, it's not just the woman that's struggling. If you're outside the top, say, um, even the top 50 in the men's and women's tournaments, you know, you're, you're traveling the world basically making ends meet more than anything. Yeah, uh, uh, but I think that's something that again, I don't. I wouldn't even draw gender lines down. That is that we, you know, for a good reason, you hear only only those that are successful, those that have made it, the superstars. But hmm. for every superstar that makes it in any given sport, really, um, there are hundreds that have worked just as hard. Um, you know, had just as sort of bright a future perhaps when they were younger, and then for whatever reason, be it, you know, their talent didn't quite get fulfilled there. I don't know, injuries psychologically didn't work out. You know, they they don't quite make it. And those that do persevere, it can be quite a struggle. Hmm. And we do you think because we're seeing this maybe more in Australia at the moment because of the the kind of tense contract situation they've got over there. But that the the women's domestic game is starting to see see investment and more prominence with the WBBL, the KSL, and as I said, with the women's team. Obviously, I don't want to call it embroiled in those contract negotiations, but yeah. but I can't think maybe of a better word because, of course, at the end of this World Cup, they're out of contract, and and one yeah. of the sticking points is that. You know, the Australian the international cricketers that those with with the name recognition, your, your Meg Lanning, your David Warners, they want to see everybody playing pro cricket in Australia rewarded, as well as the investment in in the next generation. So that there's always sort of very subtleties that that come into it, uh, but it also means that you know people are are fully professional, you know, even if they're just domestic, call it, I say just domestic players. That's a terrible way to put it. Um, but you know you can be a, you don't have to be an international to to be a professional so to speak that's maybe a better way to put it in my very clumsy language <laughs> yeah um what was what was the question well I, i'm just trying to uh, because we, as we've, we've talked about sort of tennis and if you're outside the world's top sort of however many you want to call it whether it be male or female that yeah um, you know, it, it is a struggle to get by for for a lot of people. They have to make tough choices on, you know, even down to whether they take a physio with them if, in the event of an injury. Uh, and it is one thing we're we're maybe seeing moving forward in in, in the cricket side of things. We've probably seen this more in football with, with obviously professional teams in sort of Arsenal, Man City, and and Paris Saint Germain, and so on. Are we starting to see that in cricket more now with, with women's domestic cricket becoming more? 
professionalized as you know we've seen it at the international level much more obviously but it seems to me it's happening across the board is that a fair assessment um yeah i think i'm probably quite biased on this having (laughs) obviously experienced a little bit of it with western storm yeah no i don't think it is to be honest i think that um england have put in a lot of top-down investment they've um, done a lot of things. The women's team, they've also done very well at the grassroots with their Chance to Shine programs, but I think they've there's been a gross sort of neglect of mm. anything in between. And I think that's going to start to show pretty quickly with what it is showing with the women's team. Um, I think that it's exciting because it, it's slowly moving towards a professional sort of era of women's cricket, but equally um, the transition, I think, is proving much more difficult in England than it is in Australia. And I think that's just an administrative um, failure, in my view. Um, the moment that a woman signs a contract, the demands on them are far greater than what they're getting out of it, either mm. monetary or experience-wise, in my view. And um, I think it's um, they've got to be very careful. Yeah, I, I mean, in a sense, I know you sort of said you're biased, but in a sense, I see it as maybe you're ideally placed as well because you've you've been through you know been through the the that all that part of of the English cricket program. Yeah, uh, I guess so. So you, you've sort of been on the inside of it. You've seen the the pros and the cons, uh, and and you know, obviously, having experienced the the, the KSL uh, and playing for Middlesex as well. You, there's even those, those sort of multifaceted points because some people will, if you mention you know women's domestic cricket, will automatically think KSL, which is great because yeah. obviously means the competition is growing in in its. Um, it's sort of what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, it's it's value or it's outward public appearance is growing. But obviously, if you then say, "Oh, there's you know there's county teams as well," would people be so familiar? And, and I mean, is that all part of of the process here? Is to is to promote it and 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 you mentioned sort of the administrative side of it. There is is do, is there a particular point you feel it's falling down? Yeah, I, I mean, I just really like to know what the strategy is in England, to be honest. I, I very much have the view that the Kia Super League was, uh, was an automatic reaction to the introduction of the WBBL. It was it was genuinely a sort of, oh, my goodness, they've got it, then we should have it too, <laughs> um, without really thinking in the long term how it was going to be planned, who the franchises were, um, how they were going to create a brand that was going to have longevity, because I just don't think there is longevity in the Kia Super League tournament. I think it was executed well in the fact that you know they had money to to, to throw about and, and they got obviously some sort of following in the first season but will we know who western storm is and then in, you know five years down the line i doubt it hmm. um i doubt it will still be going in five years time i think that because we've got a, a men's franchise that's going to be uh coming to play in the next uh, two years or so um the women will have little choice other than to to follow that and i can tell you one thing the men certainly aren't going to have a lot of lightning in their um in their franchises so the women therefore won't either. So it's, yeah. it, I feel as though the Kia Super League is, is very much a stopgap. Um, oh, okay. I think it was poorly thought out. I thought the contracts were horrendous. Um, and there's a reason that I'm not playing and not going back this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, there's a couple of interesting points in there. One is the, should we call it the influence of the, well, I'll just call it the BBL here, because I think the BBL has had influence on the men's game as well as the women's by the sound of it in, in that the ECB have looked, they've gone, well, this has worked out really well in Australia yeah. and they've kind of grabbed the bull by the horns without really, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I feel like the comparisons to, I'm going to sort of, as, as the men's game example, they look at, well, they say, well, they've got these, these city teams. It's like, well, the Australian geography and you know, population spread is is quite a lot different to Great Britain's. Uh, where yeah, and the weather. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, the, the weather is is always the obvious one that that comes up, and and they, they just sort of grab the these ideas a bit and go, well, that's worked for them. Yeah, and it's kind of like, well, I can understand why you would like that. Always, yeah, anything which projects a, a successful image and helps you know grow a game or, or, or grow a sport, especially where it's it has an Australia with the women's and men's game benefiting from from that, but equally sometimes uh, you need to take a step back. Does that make sense? And say, yeah, well... although I, I must say one thing going for, even though it's not quite the right sort of uh, equation or formula that they've built, um, it, it has been something that has been discussed and thought out for quite a long time. Some people may argue too long that the mm. men's franchise. So yeah. I do think that they, it is a very considered position and they have taken into account the fact that 
you know, we haven't got a nice three three week lovely weather block as you mm. might in Australia. We haven't got ninety percent of the population in cities. There is this huge tradition and attachment, let's not forget, to the county system. There are eighteen counties compared to six states in the, in Australia. There are huge differences. Mm. But I think there's also an understanding um that, you know, tournaments like the IPL, like the Caribbean uh franchise tournament, like the the BBL, they are successful. And and there is there was a feeling and there has been for some time that England are you know, losing out, perhaps. Mm. They've got a very good test arena, a very good first-class structure, arguably the best in the world, in terms of, of churning out a, te- a decent test team. Um, but but they, yeah, there are deficiencies on the short form, format, and mm. I think that it's right to explore new options, it's right to explore the franchise option, whether running a franchise tournament in conjunction with a county one is going to work in terms of just you know, too much cricket for the players and um, and, and perhaps also an adverse effect on the youngsters, the English youngsters coming through if we've got lots of, um, uh, if, their, if their places are restricted. But mm. then again, the exposure to, to international superstars could also be a plus. So I think it is a debate that's going to be ongoing. It's a debate that's worth having. I think that the men have considered a little bit more. And, and the women, as I said, it was, it was more of a knee-jerk reaction. Now, listen, I mean, I don't want to take anything away. I think that, the women, you know, the there's certainly a pride in having almost preempted the men. The women have always been very, we've always been very vocal of the fact that the first World Cup was a women's one mm. in 1973. The first T20 international was a women's one. So why not have the first um, franchise tournament in England being a women's one? And there's a lot of merit behind that. I just, I just think on the delivery aspect of it, I at least from a personal perspective, and I guess as well from uh scrutiny kind of journalist perspective just looking at the the makeup of, of the the way in which the teams are run the management the allocation of resources the treatment of players even the, the contracts but there's I've, I've got a lot of issues i think with, <laughs> with that aspect if that's the most mm. diplomatic way but I, I you know i'm behind the whole premise it was exciting there were kids that were mm. inspired certainly and, if, and at the end of the day, what we want to do is create, I think, that the, so that the one aim, if there was to be one aim, is to get more young kids, girls and boys, playing cricket and looking up mm. and having role models that are, are a man or a woman, and they don't care who. They just want to play and get involved. Yeah. So anything that can do that, you know, go for it. Yeah. I mean, it... it... It it strikes them strikes me and maybe look I mean I'm one I'm I'm the middle aged white guy so you know I'm I'm sort of sitting sitting pretty in most conversations and I'm, I'm wow. sort of consciously aware of that in many ways um, but it, I mean is is this one of those things where it is trying to find that that middle ground still that that the we, we as a cricketing nation aren't quite sure where we want to be where, uh, and we do seem to have a very, we talked about it with, with the women's team, but I think it exists with the men's as well, that, that sort of top-down type setup where the, the England mm. teams respectively are are the focus, certainly at the moment. And then it seems like the secondary focus is what we do with 2020, which I can understand, but yeah. maybe has its flaws. And we're still trying to find find our feet a little bit in, in, a, in a cricketing world, which has changed a lot because of things like the IPL. Is is that maybe part of the problem here that we're we're just not quite sure where we stand as a cricketing nation right now? Yeah, listen, it's also very easy that you know when when England are winning or things are going well, <laughs> then you just assume that everything underneath is is sort of fine and dandy. It's only when you've got a prolonged period of failure, I guess, that you start getting in reviews and mm. and the sort of reassessment of the domestic structure. So it's it's very easy just to. To brush these things aside, and it's it's also extremely unsexy to be mm. discussing the administration in the middle realms of English cricket. I mean, who cares about that really? Um, who's going to read that in the papers? Well, I can tell you, no one. Yeah. Um, so I think it's yeah, it's it's a work in progress. I think I don't think anyone's out there with bad intentions. I think even the most sort of uh, potent uh, traditional misogynists are starting to realise that even <laughs> if they don't agree with women playing sport, actually, in the future, it could um, earn them a few bucks later on in life. Mm. Um, you know, it's just a huge gap in the market, if, if not for 
uh, immediate dividends and returns, uh, certainly down the line, mm. um, if you create a sort of a, a viable brand. And I think that's what they're latching on to in the likes of Australia for the BBL. So if it's not for a pure equality perspective, from a financial perspective, suddenly this is looking, it's starting to look a little bit more um, exciting. Yeah, and I think that's a, a, a major point. And it's something that, that I've kind of mentioned before, as I said, you know, I, I don't know the inner workings very well. I'm, I'm very much sort of a casual, a casual follower as, as it were. Um, but one thing that sort of strikes me about it is, is I mean, the women's game is, is such a huge growth area for the sport just you know in terms of participation yeah. at grassroots level you know the the you, the health benefits of team sport and all this have been spoken of many 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 times over the years so you, you've got all these different advantages across the levels from grassroots and amateur and recreational kids sport and as you said at the top level you know the financial interests that, that could come with it i mean even if you want to be cynical and say it's, it's about the money well there's yeah. <laughs> there's significant upturns and advantages there as well yeah but i mean I caveat to that of course mm. is that the world revolves around short-term gains and, mm. and the women's game is still at the sort of tipping point where it's still perhaps not quite there yet but i think the more forward thinking people who are thinking are looking at this as, as, as sort of you know, sports market in many ways is, is, is totally saturated, yeah. where all the women's market isn't. And, and I think that there are schemes and there are ways in which to make very, um, what's the word, uh, attractive products. Mm. And that's starting to happen with one or two. You look at your Elise Perry's in Australia, etc. I haven't quite latched on in the same way in England, but there are certainly uh, members of, of be it cricket, be it other sporting bodies, which, which can be very attractive. And if they're used in the right way, um, can certainly be very lucrative. It's just, it's just, it, it will require input, it will require investment, and perhaps it will require a slightly more longer-term perspective, which, at the end of the day, is slightly at odds with the society we live in. <laughs> well, that's that's very true. I would argue that, and that's that's kind of the the, the frustrating part, maybe, and, and this possibly, uh, and you've touched on this already, possibly transfers over to to all aspects of the game, is that. You know, we're we're waiting till 2020 for this new franchise or city-based cricket competition, which, as you said, may well have repercussions on the women's game as well as as franchises get, I call it, you know, join. So you've got the women's or whatever, Yorkshire Vikings or or whatever they call them, or Leeds Lions or whatever, the, mm. whatever the hell they come up with. And then, of course, as you said, that that means Loughborough maybe disappears. Well, it will disappear. I mean, that was that, that in my mind, the moment that the woman decided mm. to have a franchise in Loughborough, you could have written it off there and then. Mm. Um, I don't want to sound like an angry old woman, um, <laughs> which is certainly a danger. Mm. But, you know, there, there, Loughborough is, is a great infrastructure for England cricket in mm. terms of its training, its pathways, its youth groups, its Lions or um, England academies, right? It's got all the facilities. What it does not have is a capacity to host big first-class matches that are going to see crowds of 3,000 plus. Now, for a forward-looking person thinking that I want to be having crowds of 3,000 plus in my women's games in the next five years, that's not, then you wouldn't have that, that, mm. that venue. So the fact that they've chosen that venue, to me, is a direct indication that this is not a long-term strategy. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, from what I can gather, it was a very compelling bid with lots of very well connected people involved in the Loughborough one. Yeah. Um and, and certainly it would have taken a strong person to have turned it down. But I just think if there was a, an eye to write what do we want to have as you know, who's who's going to be the franchise that's on everyone's lips in ten years, five years mm. time, I don't think Loughborough is, is the place that's going to happen. You've got first class institutions at Leicester, at Derby, um, you know, just up the road from Nottinghamshire, a huge mm -hmm. base there as well. They didn't get um they didn't get a franchise in the women's super league. So listen, I mean, it's exciting. I'm glad that I was part of it in the in the first uh, season. Mm. I think this season will be very interesting. I think there'll be a lot of very tired bodies um, <laughs> from the World Cup, and yeah. and, I'm, and it'll it'll be a test as well of the English public. You know, it's very good to host a month long World Cup, and there's lots of good coverage, be it on television, be it on radio. A lot of school kids at the ground, mm. but then you know, what's the reaction going to be to a slightly below par equivalent the following week running for two weeks? I don't know whether there'll be 
um, an appetite for that. I hope there will be. I know for, I know I'll be tired by then, um, and that's just from speaking about the, the ruddy <laughs> thing. So yeah, it, that'll be a test. That'll be interesting. Mm. And as you say, it extends it extends beyond this this sort of next six months, twelve months, whatever you want to call it, because of of the looming the looming spectre of, of the city cricket, which seems to hang over all of of English domestic cricket and to an extent international as well, because obviously it will it will inevitably clash with with England games as well, which of course is a talking point in its its own right. It's yeah, it's an interesting one, and, and I must admit I, I hadn't. <laughs> thought too greatly on what, what it would mean for the, the Kia Super League uh, and and uh, I mean obviously you've, you've got Surrey Stars which translates pretty straightforward uh, I guess maybe Yorkshire Diamonds too but as you say what does it mean specifically for, for a team like Loughborough uh, who aren't position you know, as you say when you've got Nottingham Derby and Northampton and whoever whoever emerges from that presumably Nottingham given given Trent Bridge whoever mer- mm. emerges from that uh, little wrangle and, and whether you end up with you know Trent Bridge and Derby being used for for simultaneous games do, do they not you know let's call it the, for argument's sake we'll call it Nottingham so you've got Nottingham men's at Trent Bridge and Nottingham women's at Derby on, on the same day is that how they do it how I mean, <laughs> there's all these sort of questions and obviously that that means upheaval for a league which it, it seemed to be laying down some roots at the very least uh you know for 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 the domestic women's game and, and as you say maybe they're gonna tear that up a little bit and, and it's interesting to see what impact that will have and whether people who you know they get behind Lancashire Thunder do they transfer over I guess they, the ECB would say, oh, of course they're going to transfer over. They're still going to be a Lancashire-based or Manchester-based team. But, yeah. you know, sports fans can be funny sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely, they can. And um, I think we know how vocal and uh, and staunch, perhaps, the, mm. the county fans are for a start. So we are an interesting couple of years for domestic cricket in England, both mm. men and yeah. women. Yeah, well, on that note, I'm going to use that as a maybe a slightly clumsy segue into what we've seen in, in county cricket this week with the, the attempts to use the pink ball, the day-night games. Obviously, the weather has played its part, certainly yesterday. Uh, but it's an interesting experiment, one I'm very keen to see where it goes. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that whole day-night domestic cricket and the pink ball and where it may, may lead the game moving forward within England. Yeah, I was, um, I was lucky enough to go to the first be covering actually the first uh, day night test out mm-hmm. in um, Adelaide back in what 2015 I think it was yeah. November um, and it was absolutely beautiful it was a balmy summer's evening it was a wonderful um, wonderful sunset as well but it was Adelaide and it was about 30 degrees 8 o'clock at night <laughs> and so it was lovely mm. My, I think my biggest fear for day night cricket in England is that it's ruddy cold at about that time in the evening we had yeah. a, a week perhaps of a heat wave but that was it and well you know it's never going to be scheduled within the heat wave is it um <laughs> yeah i i think it's, it's good to, to have it as um as an option hmm. i i don't think it's radically different in terms of a lot of speculation about it's harder to bat or it's the, the ball gets a little bit bigger and the scene gets something or other you know cricket is cricket is cricket Mm. Um, I don't think it will have that much impact on, on stats or anything. Yes, you might get a few anomalies as people adjust, and um, there will be issues, of course, with, with um, uh, colour blindness, which has mm. a guy balance. But I don't think it's going to be the earthquake that players um, anticipate. Equally, I don't think it's going to be the sort of transformation that some pundits perhaps think it will be. I think it's just another option. Um, I don't think we'll see that much more of it, much of it, to be honest, in England because we already have very good attendances for Test matches in particular, mm. um, and, and I can't see it as in a domestic circuit more people coming. I don't know what the the figures are for, for people coming through the gates. Mm. They seem watching. variable, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't mm. think it's it's a massive upsurge, is it? No. Um, no. So I don't I don't think it's going to be um hugely transformative in England. Mm-hmm. I think it's more something for for places like India like Australia that perhaps uh, have had issues with with attendance and interest in the longer form of the game mm. especially domestically. Um no, I think it's another option. I think it's good to have. I think it's fun. It's a bit of excitement. I don't think it's going to change the face of the earth. No. I I I think in terms of of sort of on-field action Granted that, obviously, as I say, a lot of games have been affected by by rain over the last day and, and probably today as well. Uh, but the the sort of performances didn't strike me as remarkably different 
on the field. Kent had some trouble, lost some early wickets, but yeah. you know, it, it, during every round of games that happens. And and I think uh, I can't remember where I read it, but one one person worked out in your normal air quotes red ball county game there's a wicket every 11 overs and i think there was one every 10.3 overs this week so it's not radically wow, different shock horror. <laughs> yeah and, and you know we've seen sangakara shock horror score a ton alistair cook uh you know yeah, uh, and, yeah all the usual culprits yeah you know guys who who do well pretty much all the time anyway have done well james pattinson's taken wickets again this is yeah. not nothing this is nothing new this year uh, yeah. and so it, it on the field, to me, it doesn't seem to have been radically different. Off the field, as you said, is, is kind of the, the, I don't want to call it the X factor because that probably over overstates it a little bit. It was the most interesting element of this week's games because obviously their, their hope was people were coming after work. But reading different people's comments and different reports, well, the weather, as you said, is a huge factor because it's been bloody miserable this week. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, if they stick with it, maybe it's something some people get used to kind of like when you go to a game in early April, you accept that it might be cold. And I've been to some horrendously cold games at Trent Bridge in April. Yeah. Um, so people go prepared, they'll, you know, take coats, whatever. Uh, but equally it's, it's pricing seems to have been weird. Essex was still charging the same price. If you came for just the final session where I think others were free and, uh, you know, some of it's habit because there are people who would leave the ground anyway at half past six, still leave yeah. at half past six. Uh, because, you know, they're going for the tea, and that's just yeah. that's what they do. They go to the cricket. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is they wanted to try and create, mm. you know, attract a new, a new sort of generation or, mm. or genre of cricket fans, and and perhaps it will do. Um, mm. I just, you know, it's not going to be the the sole form of cricket. It's as I said, it, it's another option. It's it's good to change things up now and again. Mm. I I just don't think that it's, it's you know, it's, we're not going to see the death of, of normal no. uh, domestic first class cricket and suddenly everything's going to be pink ball mm. if it's one a season then then hey it makes for it, it adds with everything mm. um you know when christmas comes it's exciting if you had christmas every day it'd be bloody <laughs> miserable yeah um and i think that's the same with this mm. I don't, yeah, to be honest that's kind of how i i see it as well I, you know i'd like it if it was whether they do it as one round of games a year as they have this year whether they stagger it so you know nottingham uh middlesex and yorkshire are doing the day night home game one week and then the next week it's surrey and somerset and cardiff uh glamorgan and cardiff and yeah i i'd, I'd like them to stick with it as, but because i think dropping it after one round of games is is not a fair reflection of whether it could actually do anything for the for the sport yeah. domestically here uh, but you know, like you, I don't, I don't see it as any great revolution. I just see it as something different that yeah, that absolutely. gives people a different option. And, and it did surprise me that neither Surrey nor Middlesex were at home this week. Um, I think Middlesex can only have the floodlights on so many days per summer, but so yeah. Surrey have have mastered <laughs> getting getting the post work crowd into the Oval. So yeah, as I said, yeah, I'd like people to see like me it. filtering out of the city. Mm. Yeah, precisely, and and they've done a great job of that, and to the point where you could almost have no game of cricket on, and people would still come. Just yeah, good excuse for a, for a piss yeah. up, let's be honest. <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, but is it, unfortunately we've we've run out of time for for this show. It's been fantastic to have you on. What have you got on the slate upcoming for for broadcasting and and writing and so forth? So I'm off to the um, the Clash of the Titans on Sunday. Um, unfortunately, not involving England, but um, it is Australia New Zealand mm. um, up in Brist over in Bristol, I think. And if I always forget where I'm going, it's all been so spread <laughs> out. Um, but Bristol it is on Sunday, and I think I'll be doing quite a few next week on England South Africa as well. Um, so it should be quite good. The back end of the group stages, or oh, is it middle end? I don't know. Um, but I'm looking forward to that match indeed. I'll be on on the airwaves at that at some point. Brilliant, perfect. Izzy, thank you very much for your time today. Have a Thanks great on. week and uh, no look forward too. to hearing you on Sunday. Super.